This lovely video is sponsored by Raycon. Oh look, there they are. Tee <laughs> Raycon have carved a name for themselves in the premium audio space like a conquering king, by offering a range of premium tech products at a great price, along with free shipping, buy now, pay later options, and easy and free returns. As someone who constantly listens to musical videos, I've been a long time fan of their everyday earbuds. I use them constantly, either around the house or when I'm going out for a walk or a run. They're practically grafted to my ears now. But this past year, they've expanded with the introduction of their new line of Raycon Home and Raycon PowerTech products. Oh wait, it rotates? That's... that's actually really cool. Whee! Oh look, it's that time of year again when we have to listen to this song 50 times a day. I wonder if there's something we can do to make this easier on ourselves. That one's perfect for the Swifty in your family, am I right? I might get that one for my mum actually. She likes listening to Michael Bublé a little bit too much. Oh and what's this? They've got Black Friday and Cyber Monday sales across their whole website with some products up to 50% off. You can save even more with these limited time bundles. These are the biggest holiday discounts Raycon's ever done, but they're only available for one week, so be sure to get yourself a deal by November 27th. So click the link in the description or go to buyraycon.com slash cynical reviews to get up to 50% off site-wide. And of course, to help support this lovely channel, you lovely people. What do you think is the scariest thing in the world? Just picture it in your mind for me. If you said gay people, you would be correct. Can you imagine if the whole world were run by gay people? <laughs> well, that's the premise of the anti-bullying film Love Is All You Need, a short film that depicts a world in which being homosexual is considered the norm and heterosexuals are a persecuted minority, which I'm sure is someone's fetish. And it's basically the, this is the future liberals want meme. There's a question mark at the end, so am I supposed to call it, love is all you need? Well, I'm not going to do that, because that's going to get really annoying. It was originally produced in 2011, with the intention of being shown in schools. One teacher actually attracted an uproar from a bunch of pearl-clutching homophobic parents, who were mad that their kids were being shown a film which had the audacity to suggest that gay kids maybe shouldn't be bullied to death. The film was leaked onto YouTube in 2013, where it went viral, gathering over 30 million views. Given what we're about to discuss, I doubt that virality was generated for the right reasons. The creators put a positive spin on this though, and on the back of this newfound audience, writer and director K. Rocco Shields decided to crowdfund the creation of a feature film, which would expand the story and reach a larger audience. Despite all six Indiegogo campaigns for the short failing miserably, and both the Indiegogo and donation page for the movie having disappeared into the ether, they were somehow able to raise $3.6 million. The resulting film was released in 2016, and I would really like to know where that money went. The purpose of Love Is All You Need was to serve as an educational tool for school kids. The idea being that if homophobic bullying was turned on its head, the shoe put on the other foot, it would serve to illustrate just how ridiculous, unjustified, and harmful such bullying is, and thereby help to reduce discrimination against LGBT people. If our world was reversed, and people that are straight were actually gay, and people that were gay were actually considered straight, I wonder if portraying a story like that would actually show people how ridiculous this all is. And it's not like I disagree with that message at all. Homophobia and bullying are both, indeed, bad. Hmm, <clears throat> yeah, it's very daring today, aren't I? And I don't doubt the creator's sincerity when they say that they were inspired by real-life bullying incidents and wanted to put an end to them. There's nothing wrong with being an activist or having good intentions, right? But you do need to have something solid to back it up. I think if you're going to have a message in something that you make, you need to convey that message as well as you can. But you also need to have a good product first and foremost, and you need to make sure that you're not just bludgeoning your audience over the head with it. And as we will see, dear viewer, unfortunately, love was not all they needed. As with other things I've covered before, like Ben and Arthur or Cyberbully, this is another case of message good, medium bad. I'll do a quick plot run through of each of the movies so that we're up to speed, but after that, it, there's kind of a lot of overlap between them in terms of topics. So I'll try to cover them both at the same time, so that I'm not endlessly repeating myself. Also, I wouldn't be surprised if this video gets demonetized just because of the subject matter, so do feel free to check out the Patreon. It's down there, somewhere. Also, buy Raycon.com slash reviews.
Searching around for a copy of the short film, a version in 360p was uploaded to the Genius Produced YouTube channel, Genius Produced being the production company owned by Shields, who I'm fairly certain wrote this channel description herself. I was very much enjoying the potato quality cinematography though. It reminded me of the classic era of YouTube when the worst thing you had to worry about was obnoxious reply girls clogging up the sidebar with their... content? However, a better version was eventually uploaded to Shields' channel about a year ago, with a certain scene that we'll be discussing later removed. So fortunately we don't have to develop myopia in order to... uh... In enjoy it? The story follows Ashley, a straight girl born to lesbian parents who has a happy childhood but eventually realises that she's not like everyone else. At one point she and her friends play house, but they're disgusted by the suggestion that they play mummy and daddy instead of mummies and daddies. Her school has a production of Romeo and Julio, an alternate version of Romeo and Juliet, and the other kids make fun of her for wanting the role of Julio to be written for a girl so that she can play it. Her parents want her to play football, because in this world it's girls that play football and boys are into theatre, but she didn't make the team and is more excited about the play. She tells them that her drama teacher told them that Shakespeare wrote it to secretly express his love for a woman, an inverse of the theory that Shakespeare was at the very least bisexual. Her parents get upset and also talk shit about a heterosexual couple who just moved in down the street. She witnesses that couple being on the receiving end of abuse, in an environment fostered by the bigoted preachings of a female Catholic priest. Yeah, that's a thing in this world as well. There's even a female Pope. As she's being given a swirly by some bullies, a teacher intervenes, but basically says it's her own fault. You know, Ashley, maybe if you got yourself a girlfriend, all this teasing would stop. While struggling with feelings of self-hatred, she receives abusive text messages, and then meets up with the boy she likes in an empty auditorium. He talks about how his brother found out about them, and how his family is very heterophobic. They go in for a kiss anyway, but get interrupted. He denounces her, and the bullies pursue her in an overwrought and melodramatic sequence so that they can play... Smear the Qu- She runs into his big brother, who punches her to the ground, and then they beat her while chanting Smear the Qu- and writing Hetero on her forehead. When Ashley arrives home, her parents get into an argument because the more bigoted mum thinks it's their fault. While she's lying in bed, she gets bombarded with more abusive texts, although a lot of them are from the same people over and over again. Someone even drives by the house to shout abuse at her, and at this point it's like, okay, we get it. In the face of all this pressure and abuse, she decides to... How do I, how do I say this in a YouTube-friendly way? What even are the guidelines nowadays? Um, quit Twitter? And the scene is actually pretty graphic. Like, I can't show it on here because it's just too much for YouTube. And bear in mind, this was meant to be shown in schools? To, to teenagers, like young teenagers? Surely there was a better way they could have done this? And this film does not have a warning. Like, I, I guess it was made before those were a thing. So yeah, if anything like that does trigger you, make sure you're watching that G-rated edit if you do want to check it out for yourself. I think this film is a teacher's dream. You know, I'm not so sure about that one, actually. And the scene goes on for so long. Considering the short is only 17 minutes long, the self-ending bit lasts almost three of those. And meanwhile, her parents struggle to break down the door to save her in time. If only they'd had a man in the house. But anyway, that's where it ends, with the implication that she dies, and a message that all the events we saw are true stories from victims of bullying. Okay, well, that was a downer. Here's some Neil Breen to lighten the mood. I can't believe you committed suicide. I cannot believe you committed suicide. How could you have done this? How could you have committed suicide? As for the feature film, it follows the adve- <laughs> Anyhow, the feature film follows several characters and their plot lines, although some are far more developed than others. The two primary ones are Emily, who takes the role of Ashley from the short film and whose story follows a lot of the same beats, although now she's younger so the things that happen to her feel more messed up. And then there's Jude, the quarterback and star of the football team, who is currently going through an identity crisis. And yep, this is one of those films where young students are played by 30 year olds. At a party she starts talking to Ryan, who's a pledge for a fraternity and wants to write an article about her. The frat leader's jawline is putting in some serious work. Emily's mother takes her to meet their new neighbours, who turn out to be a heterosexual couple. Oh no! Disgusted, she quickly drags Emily away. 
As in the short film, Emily's parents want her to play football, but she's really bad at it. But she bonds with the water boy, Ian. Yeah, told me I was so uncoordinated. Even Jesus wouldn't want to play with me. Jesus Christ, that is a fucked up thing to say to a child. Jude and Ryan and Emily and Ian continue to bond with one another, and eventually Jude and Ryan enter into a forbidden relationship, which Jude keeps hidden from her girlfriend Kelly, played by Emily Osment from Cyberbully. Maybe she'll get the cap off this time. I can't get the cap off. No, no, no. But she does give us arguably the best scene in the movie. Emily's drama teacher is rewriting Romeo and Julio as Romeo and Juliet. She and Ian want to audition for the title roles. Ian's heterophobic sister bullies her for being excited about it. And later she and her friends send Emily a bunch of abusive texts, as in the short film. I'm gonna have to come up with a better way of saying that. Ryan takes Jude for a ride on a carousel, and I'm sure there's an innuendo there somewhere. And eventually they break into the college swimming pool, where they make the beast with two backs. Which, first of all, come on, a public pool? That's nasty. Second, sex underwater is really not as nice as it sounds. Take it from me. Also, they're doing it without any contraceptives? Could there be consequences, maybe? That's a no. That, the, answer, the answer to that question is a no. Although it did give us this amazing quote entry on IMDb. Kelly sees them and is understandably a bit upset. Jude goes to see her virulently heterophobic priest, who's got some serious dommy mommy energy going on. Ugh. She doesn't reveal that she's hetero, but the priest urges her to break up with Kelly and not lead her on anymore. So Jude goes to break up with Kelly, in public, mind you. But Kelly asks that they stay together until she wins the election for Homecoming Queen. But before this can happen, Kelly outs her to the entire university. There must not have been enough money in the budget for coloured ink, although that part is kind of realistic, I guess? Meanwhile, Ryan gets kicked out of his fraternity because he doesn't want to do seven minutes in heaven with another dude. I don't have to prove anything. Yes. You do. I mean, I get it, I really do, but aren't you pledging to a fraternity? Isn't proving yourself kind of the whole point? Emily's parents berate her for wanting to be in the play and then complain about the drama teacher, who later gets fired for being pro-heterosexual, and that's where his storyline ends. We have a repeat of the swirly scene from the short film, but this time the teacher is actually sympathetic. You know the only reason those girls do this is because of the jealous of you, right? Well, no, some people are just bigots. Emily talks to Ian about the play being cancelled and the drama teacher being fired. I'm never going to get to kiss a boy. Kiss a boy? What are you talking about? Are, are you gay? Like a hetero? Ian rejects and disowns her because she might be a hetero. In a story in the local paper, Kelly puts the blame for her outing Jude on the priest, claiming that she was told that it was her religious duty. At the next football game, there's a huge crowd of anti-hetero protesters who've been urged on by the priest, and Jude's team lets her get dogpiled by the opposition. Sure, let your star quarterback get annihilated while you're trying to win the game. Great strategy, fucking morons. At the same time, the game cuts back and forth to show Emily having her bike vandalised, and then a repeat of the smear the scene led by Ian's sister who, inspired by the priest, thinks that she's doing God's work. As Jude is being led away in an ambulance, Ryan tries to get to her but is abducted by the frat boys. Urged on by the priest, who insists that they're doing God's work, they tie him to the carousel and turn him into a human piñata. Emily goes home after the attack, the parents have an argument, and she gets sent to her room. She watches recordings of the attack on Ryan while Ian's sister stands outside her house hurling objects and abuse. Seriously, does this girl not have any hobbies? Overwhelmed, Emily tries to take the lid off a bottle of pills, but she can't- she, she can't get the cap off! I was joking when I said that earlier, I didn't think they'd actually do this! Fuck's sake. Then we get a repeat of the final scene from the short, except it's less explicit, her parents get the door open quicker, and she survives. Ryan, however, doesn't survive his ordeal, and Jude and Emily meet at his funeral. Why do people hate us so much? They don't understand love like ours. Isn't our love the same as theirs? Maybe someone should teach them that. Very subtle. The priest is in prison for being an accessory to a hate crime. Above all, love each other deeply. Because love covers over a multitude of sins. This is a poetic response to the priest's earlier statement that you can't pick and choose what scripture you follow. Basically, if you can eat shellfish, I can eat cock. And the whole thing ends with Jude listening to a love message that Ryan left her during the game. So that's what the films are about, but are they any good? I mean, obviously they're not because they're being featured on this channel. 
like I said, you need to have a good product first and foremost, and this ain't it, chief. There's technical things you can point to, like the short film employing these weird colour filters throughout the whole thing for no discernible reason. Or maybe they were just terrible at colour balancing. The sound design and audio mixing is atrocious, with the audibility of dialogue varying considerably within the same scene. Mr. Thompson. Thank you. Far too many times, the music is too loud, so you can't hear what the hell they're saying. Porter's got game. It's also often either cliched or inappropriate for the scene. Or sometimes cuts out abruptly. <laughs> Did you go to a religious university? Well, it was the only... The dialogue contains words that might be said in actual conversations, but is often written, structured, and delivered in ways that make them feel wooden and inauthentic. Ashley, did you tell your mom that you got cast in the school play? School play? I thought we decided you were trying out for the football team. The acting is pretty dog shit. What are you doing? Get away from me! Ian. I don't know why she keeps touching me like this. I was just trying to be nice to her. I hate you, Ashley Curtis. The movie is so poorly paced and boring that it feels twice its two hour length and does nothing to justify that extra time. It doesn't do anything that the short film doesn't and takes seven times as long to do so. My purpose is to make this film because I... Could have fooled me. Quite a few scenes drag on far too long or are completely unnecessary. They lingered so long on this kissing shot that I started to forget what website I was on. And about halfway through the runtime, the movie starts employing a non-linear structure, flashing forward to after the current events multiple times without making it obvious that that's what they were doing. It was a little confusing. And this thing. What is this thing? Like seriously, this isn't a bit, this, this is actually in the movie. What the hell is this thing? Did they order their mascot from Timu? Although, let's be real, the movie would have been much improved if this DeviantArt Sonic OC reject was in the background of every scene with no explanation. Maybe he could be like the straight monster or something? And just from a writing and world building perspective, Love Is All You Need is really quite disappointing. They only changed one thing, but they really didn't unpack all the consequences of that change. I understand why they wouldn't do this in the short film, because they didn't have time. But as the director herself proclaimed, she wanted to elaborate more on this world. By making a feature version of the short, this allows us to reach a larger, more diverse audience and go more in-depth into the reversed world. But then they didn't? The world building in this scenario is half assed to put it mildly. Even ChatGPT would have produced a more inventive script than this. This scenario is basically just opposite day. It really is Adam and Steve in this universe, and that's as deep as it goes. An intriguing premise quickly becomes boring because they just don't do anything with it. Having a society where being gay is the norm raises a lot of questions about how such a society would function or how this change would influence human behaviour, almost none of which is explored. Like how would bathrooms work in this universe? Part of the motivation for gendered bathrooms is not wanting to be around others that might be attracted to you, right? Would men and women still choose to mostly hang out with their own sex despite this change in everyone's sexuality? Do frat parties just turn into massive orgies now? And I'm sure at least some of you have been pondering this question. Daddy CJ, if everyone is gay, where do the kids come from? Well, dear viewer, I am so glad that you asked. Apparently, they have a breeding season. It is an abomination for a woman to lie with a man outside of the breeding season. You know how during the, the breeding, you know, the periods, uh, breeding periods, when a couple agrees on having a, a child, um, they in order They're to have the kid, they go to uh, a, a woman and, uh, and a man. Gross. In humble donation during the breeding season, so new sons and daughters can be brought forth. And no, they do not elaborate on what that involves. For many of you, this will mean much less breeding. For me, much, much more. As in real life, religion plays a big role in fostering the bigotry. But it's so strange and nonsensical that they would still have a big focus on life and the family while also stigmatising the activity that creates life. In fact, the idea that any successful religion would denounce an activity necessary for the continued existence of the human race is kind of insane. 
And I'm not saying they're right, and of course the point of this scenario is to show how ridiculous the bigotry is, but in this case it doesn't work in reverse. I've already put way more thought into this than the writer did, and I think if I try and do any more my brain's gonna fall out my ears. And I'm sure some of you are thinking, oh, you're just being nitpicky, like this stuff doesn't really matter. Well, maybe. But I'm a fan of dystopian fiction, alright? I love when this stuff is done well, and I don't when it's not. Okay? There's a few other fumbles when it comes to the writing. Um, heterosexuality is the leading cause of teen suicide in these- Um, I'm not really sure that's how you wanted to phrase that. And while the things that happen to Jude aren't justified at all, my sympathy is a bit more limited due to the fact that she's actively cheating on her girlfriend. I mean, it's just not really a good look, is it? You need to go and let her know. And then you bring your new girlfriend here. Together, we're gonna pray together for forgiveness because deceit is a sin. For fuck's sake, you're not supposed to be making the raging bigot look good. That was your one job. But what about the themes? The themes! Look, something having good themes doesn't automatically make that thing good, and doesn't redeem it if it was already bad. And it's not like I disagree with the themes of Love Is All You Need, I just think they could have gone about conveying them in a more effective way. Like by not being unintentionally funny. You shouldn't be friends with her. It is perfectly okay for boys to be friends with girls. Yeah. No, it's not. Turning things on their head is a fairly common form of absurdist humour, with the jokes being derived from how ridiculous the inverse situation is to the norm. The problem with Love Is All You Need is that it ends up having this humorous effect without trying to. So this is the little bait that tried to hold my brother's hand. Look, maybe I'm just sick in the head, but this feels like a comedy sketch. Am I wrong? You know, Ashley, this school has a zero tolerance policy for this kind of behaviour. Imagine if your mothers had seen you holding hands with a boy in public. Like, how am I supposed to watch this and take it seriously, you know? I don't I don't know how the kids watching this kept a straight face. Speaking of faces, watching a kid get punched in the face in a hate crime shouldn't be funny, but it is here. But what really doesn't help are the slurs that they came up with for heterosexual people. Poor, I knew they were rows. What's a row? What are you, Emily? Some kind of row. What, no. Why are you acting like such a candy-ass row, huh? And you're never talking to that ugly Roe. You can run, your little Roe! But you won't get away! Roe is clearly meant to be short for hetero, but it sounds so stupid. Roe, 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 It would be like calling a homosexual a mo. But it gets worse. The other slur that they use is breeder. That's really disgusting. What, are you some kind of breeder? We don't play with breeders. Telling everyone that you're a disgusting breeder. You friggin' breeder. Do I even need to comment? Sometimes they give up and just use the F slur. breeder! And to muddy the waters, they call being straight gay. I, I, um, I'm not gay. Which does get a little confusing. And the way the films push the message in your face is really quite obnoxious. It's worse in the short film, but that's only because the long film is padded out with so much pointless stuff. I don't doubt them when they say that the events portrayed are things that actually happen to LGBT people, because a lot of the discrimination and abuse that we see absolutely does in fact happen. It's far from unheard of for homophobic parents to not want their kids around them. Ashley, I want you and Cooper going around the other way to school. But that's twice as long. I don't care. I'm not going to have you exposed to that perverted lifestyle, men and women living together. It's a sin, it makes me sick just thinking about it. It's so... revolting. For them to be victim-blamed and told that it's just a phase they're going through? This is just a phase that you're going through. You'll grow out of it. To be denounced by religious authorities? Any such person harboring lust in their heart for the opposite sex will burn in hell. To receive verbal and physical abuse? <laughs> Have homophobes show up to protest at their funerals? And being at higher risk of mental health issues and deleting their life accounts? Yes, all these things do happen, and I'm aware that they're being put in to demonstrate a point. But so many of them happen within such a short space of time that it becomes ridiculous and actually detracts from the message by being unbelievable. I feel like having the entire town conga line up to rag on her like that scene in Airplane is actually detrimental to the point you're trying to make. And Ryan's beating scene gets dragged on so long that I felt like I was watching The Passion of the Christ, but with shittier music and fewer demon babies. 
After a while, it just starts to lose its impact. Quite literally, in this case. Ultimately, it's just all so unsubtle and overbearing. Like, I'm sure there are ways to educate people without metaphorically slapping them in the face with a baseball bat. The short film comes across like one of those cringy da man inspirational films. But not inspirational, actually, it's way more depressing. Maybe there's a hetero heaven. And the long film is what happens when you try to take that butter and spread it over too much bread. Again, I don't doubt the sincerity of the creators, but there were a couple of things that did kind of rub me the wrong way. Like, calling your production company Genius Produced feels, I don't know, it just feels a little bit conceited. And why would you say that Genius doesn't care about accolades, but still show all of the accolades you won for the short film? It's like you're trying to have your cake and eat it too. There just seemed to be a lot of patting yourself on the back going on. And I'm not trying to shit on anyone that these films have helped, whether it's because it changed their minds on this issue, or because it gave them comfort in their own bad situation. But I don't think Love Is All You Need was ever going to convert that many people. A committed homophobe will probably look at this and go, Yeah, but it's not the same thing. It's fine when we do it. It reminds me of that scene in Cyberbully. You've been called a slut and a whore. Really. There's fairy, fruit, homo. Do get a list? Yeah, but I mean, it's not really the same thing. I mean, you really are gay. What they're saying about me isn't true. Or maybe they'll think, see, this is what they do if they were in charge, so it's fine for us to do it to them. Which is genuinely how some of them think anyway. Putting yourself in another's shoes, as this film is trying to do, can of course help to foster empathy. It's why I think everyone should work in a customer service job for at least a few months, so they've got no excuse to be a raging Karen. But maybe this is just me, but I feel like you shouldn't have to do that in the first place. You shouldn't have to literally be in someone else's shoes in order to recognise that an injustice towards them is wrong. You don't have to be a slave in order to think that slavery is wrong. For me at least, I, I feel like that's where true empathy lies. I think these films would have worked better if they just played it straight, so to speak. Just show things as they actually happen. Stuff like Boys Don't Cry, or even Valerie's subplot in V for Vendetta do a much better job at humanising LGBT people, and thus generating empathy from an audience. Although of course those weren't intended to be shown in schools. And if it weren't for the premise of a dystopian world run by gay people, no one would have paid any attention to these films, and I probably wouldn't be talking about them. Love Is All You Need is far from the worst or most cringeworthy thing I've explored, but it's still a misfire that's good for a few laughs and lessons, and I haven't really seen anyone else talk about it on here. It's a good example of, a good message does not a good movie make. Still, it is a good message, so better luck next time. If there is a next time. But did you really have to call them breeders? Hey folks, thanks for watching, hope you enjoyed it. If you did, do consider becoming a patron or YouTube channel member. You'll get early access to ad-free and uncensored versions of videos, as well as a mention here in the credits. Thanks again to Raycon for sponsoring, by raycon.com slash cynical reviews, do check them out. Check out my merch store, join my public Discord server, and all my social media is down below. Thanks again, and I'll see you in the next one.